welcome to our 11th Wonder Space Journey, where we ask our guests to orbit around wonder and their stories of hopefulness. In our weekly episodes, we ask the same six questions reflected with the words on the timeline at the bottom of the screen. Today, we share this virtual window seat 250 miles above Earth with musician, songwriter and producer Fraser T. Smith, whose new Future Utopia album poses 12 questions around issues such as faith and freedom, race, gender, equality and ecology. But we start by asking Fraser which city or country he would like us to fly over and why. For me at this very moment, I would do a fly past New York. I think that the climate in America, I, I, I'm struggling actually to, to understand how intense that must be there, Steve. But there must be hope and there must be unity. And I think at the moment, the, the country must feel completely splintered and turned on its head with the, the the lack of security of people knowing what the next chapter holds. I think it's something about New York that to me encapsulates America and I don't want to give those guys a flyby. I grew up in a small town near High Wycombe, 30 miles west of London and pretty culturally barren and I was drawn to music from a very very young age didn't have musical parents but my nan was a self-taught stride piano player and used to play in the bars and clubs and I think picked up my love for music through her and we used to go and see her in South London and and I just used to marvel at her playing the piano so I developed that love of music not through formal training but through listening to as much music as I, as I could and had a small guitar when I was a kid and loved the guitar. Then going to secondary school, I developed that in the music room um, with Tom Rowlands from the Chemical Brothers, was a good friend of mine and we used to jam and explore different types of sounds on the guitar and, and drum machines. And then took that love of music, started playing in bands, came out of school, didn't do particularly well, bought myself some time by doing a course in business studies, which was one of the last things that I really wanted to do, but that just got me into London. And then joined some more bands, but unfortunately joining bands wasn't part of the course syllabus uh, for business studies, so got thrown out after a year. <laughs> but on the side had managed to do um, some some guitar training and actually was awarded a scholarship at the West London School of Music uh, which I did for two years and met some great musicians and then became a session guitar player it makes it sound like I came out of music college and suddenly started doing great gigs the bit in the middle which was probably five years of lots of washing up lots of pulling pints and doing kind of jobs I didn't really want to do um, existed and then worked my way up to playing with people like Rick Wayman through playing in bars and clubs and and I guess doing what my nan had done you know playing at had a, a residency at All Bar One in St John's Wood at uh, the Marriott in Heathrow you know where people really not interested in um, hearing your music but you, you're doing it because you love it and and you're developing your craft so then had a an amazing few years with Rick Waitman and Tony Hadley touring and recording loads of albums with Rick so that was an amazing apprenticeship as a musician to learn from one of the masters of of modern music then got the opportunity of playing with a very young at that time Craig David who was 17 when I met him and he he gave me a, a demo cassette of four songs which was fill me in seven days walking away and rendezvous and I just thought, at that point I was starting to get into music production, but I thought I can't resist playing guitar with this guy because it's just, it's so fantastic. We ended up having 
an amazing five years together where we toured the world and then I made the decision that I, I really wanted to become a writer and a producer so started that in a timely fashion because I just met the love of my life Sarah at that point and she had introduced me to her and now our lovely daughter Amber who was two at the time so I became a producer a husband and a dad in very short succession which was the most mind-blowing experience um but we then going from guitar player to producer is not as smooth a transition as you'd think i mean i had all the musical skills but there was a lot of technique to learn in the studio so it took me a while but had the support of sarah um who stood behind me the whole way because we had some pretty lean years financially in terms of not being able to get the kind of gigs that i aspired to because i was just learning so you know i turned down all, lots of well paying guitar jobs but I had to be very strong in what I wanted to do and then started working with Kano and Plan B in the in the early days of um, UK grime and and where hip-hop was coming to the fore and then wrote a song with James Morrison and uh, an amazing writer called Nina Woodford called Broken Strings which did really well and at the same time I had written a song with Tinchy Strider called Take Me Back and Tyo Cruz. That went to number two, and I think Broken Strings was number three. And then had a, a run of number ones with artists like Adele, Set Fire to the Rain, um, CeeLo, his Lady Killer album. I think it had three number ones with, with Tinchy Strider and, and Dappy. And went to America and started exploring all the opportunities there with artists like Britney Spears and Celine Dion and then hit a little bit of a wall because everything had happened quite quickly and thought that maybe I'd I'd had my day in terms of production because I'd, I'd won a Grammy, I'd, I'd had loads of number ones, I'd done really well and I, I wondered whether that was, that was it. So I formed a publishing company called 70 Hertz and with a view to signing young artists and then I met Kano who, as I said before, I'd worked with at the beginning of his career and has been a long time collaborator and we decided to make a record called Made in the Manor where he didn't have a deal and I was doing it just for the love of it so really regained the love of music and it turned out that it did really really well and it was nominated for a Mercury Prize and then in the mix of that I met up with a young Stormzy who wanted me to work on his first record so I was able to to do something with him that I'm very proud of and in the mix of all of that Damon Albarn approached me to work on the Gorillaz record so it was a bit like I had a few years where I wasn't too sure what was going on and then all of a sudden all the buses arrive at once you know so uh, and then Dave approached me to start working with him and again a completely different dynamic because he and I write principally on piano so we ended up doing two EPs together and, and his first album and then hit and I call them walls but I'm, I'm not afraid of the walls so I don't want it to feel as though I'm, I'm ungrateful but I do definitely come to these walls or or cliff faces or or edge of the cliffs where I, I sort of feel I have to do something reinvent myself in order to move forward because I think that for me to do another record in the vein of Made in the Manor, Gang Signs and Peril Psychodrama I'm not sure how I could reinvent myself or or help any other artists so I decided to take a break and, and in that time came up with the 12 questions which is the bedrock of my record so it's a in effect a solo record but it's under the name of future utopia and it's asking 12 questions to some of the sharpest creative minds in rap music and singing in alternative music and activism in poetry and i've got some incredible answers and and had a, a ball making the music and and interviewing the the artist for the record. I would say the place of reset is at our home. Sarah and I, my wife, have created this space in the middle of a valley in the Chilton Hills and the studio is right in the middle of here. The, the house, Sarah Sculpture Studio is next door. I feel that, that this is utopia for me. I think of all the wonders, the Northern Lights excite me the most. 
Sarah and I went to Finland and, and took some skidoos out in the middle of the night and were able to see that. And I think the sense of awe that you feel when you're looking up at those, the sense of wonder, the sense of possibility, the sense of infinity is something that that never leaves you once you've you've seen those. What I found through my career is that the, now the democracy of music is really exciting in that whether you're through a council estate or a project in America or some kind of ghetto in Africa, you know, you can make some kind of music that can be recorded in a basic way and if it's, if it's good it can be shared. So I think that the, the, the modern culture of, of self-expression is one that's, that's so wonderful and it, it's not being held by the gatekeepers really with the locks on the doors that only let a select few through. And I think that that democracy and that, that freedom is, is really what's inspiring me at the minute. Well, it's interesting looking down on the world from this wonderful viewpoint. And when I was thinking about this question, I, I thought about my meeting with Albert Woodfox, who is on the album and is a Black Panther that was incarcerated for 43 years in a six by three feet cell for a crime that he didn't commit for 23 hours a day. And the thing that struck me most about asking him what the cost of freedom was, and I had no idea how he was going to answer that, was that he views freedom as a construct within your own mind. So whether you're sat like Tim Peake, looking down at the world from wherever your point of view is, or you could be held in solitary confinement, Albert's argument is that freedom is is available to everyone because freedom exists in your mind. And I think that in these days of lockdown and in these days of political insecurity and financial insecurity, it's really interesting to take away that thought from someone that has really lived on the extreme end of, of life and of extreme end of captivity to let us know that, that you can actually be free in your mind. You can hear Fraser's collaborative album, 12 Questions, under the artist's name, Future Utopia. Amongst these most challenging of times, we believe that wonder through nature and music and art, together with stories of hopefulness from business with purpose, impact investment and non-profits, all have the potential to lift our eyes and bring a different kind of perspective. You can find out more, hear previous episodes and join the community at Our Wonder space. Thank you to Fraser for joining us in Wonder Space this week. We leave you with the last 90 seconds of the track which features an interview with Albert Woodfox, who spent 43 years in solitary confinement. This song asks, what's the cost of freedom? So freedom isn't about your external situation or your environment. Well, it gives you the ability to control your environment. You know, that's what freedom is. It's the ability, like I say, to take your philosophical views or your theoretical views or your personal views or whatever and make it real. You know, move, move it from within yourself to outside yourself. Like I said, I, I think I achieved mental, emotional, and philosophical freedom when I was around in my early 40s. But when I re-educated myself and I had accumulated enough experience and wisdom where I was able to define what kind of person I've been wanting to be for the rest of my life. But I, at, at the time, also time, that I realized that there was a limitations to what I could achieve because I was physically still in prison.